family. What are your thoughts when you hear this word? Dinners, birthday parties, graduations, and weddings? Do you think of love, intimacy, and laughter? Or do you think of pain, absence, and conflict? Whatever your thoughts are, family was God's idea. His desire is for you to join His vibrant and growing family. A family marked by sacrifice and acceptance, marked by diversity and unity, marked by an eternal significance. A family like that would be no ordinary family. As we get into this today, we're going to jump in pretty quick. I'm going to end this series on, um, on family, no ordinary family. We're talking about uh, the, the church family as well as our, our personal families. And, and um, today we're going to talk about healthy boundaries. I thought about naming, <laughs> I thought about naming this message. Um, we, need, we need to build a wall. We need to build a wall. We need to build a big, beautiful wall. But I thought that's kind of a lengthy title. So, um, and it's really, it's not a political message. But I, how many know boundaries are needed? Yeah. My, my home has property lines. Anybody else relate? You, you have property lines. And, and those property lines indicate that you're responsible for what goes on inside those property lines. And and, and, and so we want to talk about boundaries, and those boundaries, I, I, try, uh, I try to keep the, the bad out, right, and the good in. That, that's what, we, it's what we, we attempt to do, and, and um, you know, I, I was, we were driving down the road, and, you know, we were talking about the wall, we were driving down the road, and, and my boys were asking me some questions, and, and uh, the topic of the wall <laughs> came up, and, and I said, you know, there's no easy answer, but I do know one thing. Um, that it's not healthy for us to not control our borders. And, and, I, and I just asked them a question, my 15 and 12-year-old son. I, I just asked them, I said, can you think of anything that would be bad? Uh, what, anything that would be negative um, concerning the controlling of our borders? In other words, if we don't control who comes into this country, can you tell me what would be bad about that? And they just rattled off four or five things that are just common sense and practical. Um, it's not about it's not about keeping people out so much as creating a healthy boundary that keeps bad out and good in, right? And, and so some of you are probably thinking, well, can we get the bad that's already in out? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Um, but but boundaries are necessary. How many like the lines in the road that give boundaries? Right? And do you ever feel like you ever get upset when somebody violates the boundaries and pulls over in front of you or almost hits you? Um, we don't like those. We don't like those boundary jumpers. Right? And so um, boundaries are there to protect us. They're, um, we're, we're, we, we need to be thankful for boundaries. So we're going to talk about in a family, in the body of Christ, uh, we're going to talk about uh, boundaries, and also in our, in our family, our, our own families, the, those dynamics of boundaries. And, and I'm just going to touch the surface. There, this is, so, this, this is so, such a broad topic, but we're just going to touch on a little bit on this today. I'm going to go to a bunch of scriptures. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a few places you can turn to. Malachi 3, <laughs> Malachi Mal- Malachi um, 3. I uh, just thought I'd throw that out there. It'd be funny. Uh, uh, <laughs> You know, I, phonics, phonics didn't work for me <laughs> because I spell things the way they sound and I'm from Texas and I don't pronounce things right. So um, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, we'll go to a couple of places in John, so we can, ju- you can turn to John chapter 14, Exodus 20, and, um, and Galatians 6. I'll give you a few places you can mark. And Malachi 3, 2 Thessalonians 3. John 14 and Exodus 20. Let's pray. And God, we, we, we thank you for your word and that you were, you've given it to us. Your word is a, it's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. It's the thing that guides us in life that 
or is at least available to guide us through life. And so, Father, we receive your word today. Your, your word that was, that was spoken, that was written for us, we receive it right now in Jesus' name. And we sit at your feet. We ask you to speak to us. Speak to us clearly. Your sheep hear your voice. That's what you said. So, Father, we, we come with expectation that we are going to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, God sets boundaries. I, I mean, no, God's love is unconditional. It'll reach you where you're at. At your worst, he loves you, right? So God, God loves us. God, God's love is unconditional. He will love you. Uh, you can reject him, and, re- and he's still going to love you. God so loved the world, right? All of humanity. God loves us. But God has boundaries. And so although his, his love uh, reaches beyond all boundaries, God is a boundary setter. Let me, let me just give you an example. God set the boundaries of the cosmos. The earth is just far enough away from the sun that we don't burn up or freeze. It, 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 and, and it stays there because he set the boundaries. God set the boundaries of the sea. He said, you, you come that far, that's as far as you can come. God set the boundaries for that. God set boundaries in the Garden of Eden. He gave Adam and Eve every tree. The garden is yours, every tree. Every tree in the garden is good for fruit, every, every one of them, except this one right here. He set a boundary around that tree. That is, you can't have that tree. If you eat of that tree, if you eat of that tree, you'll die. Everybody's like, well, why in the world would God put that tree in the middle of the garden? God is a boundary setter. Boundaries are good. They're healthy. A lot of times, we, we struggle to set healthy boundaries in the way we relate to one another. And God, yet God is very good at setting boundaries. He's very intentional about setting boundaries. Um, just uh, go, to, go to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. And if you're from, from Texas, uh, Malachi. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. This is, this is boundaries. God sets up boundaries. This is what he says. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. God longs to pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. How many are like, I'm up for that? I am totally up for that. How many would like for God to rebuke the devourer for your sake? How many feel like there are times in your life like the enemy is robbing? He is stealing from you and your family. How many would like for God to bow up and say, "Uh uh-uh, back off, buddy. This one's my child. Here's the boundary that God set. He says, this is what I want to do for you, and I'm going to do this for you. He says, you can even test me in this. This is what, this is the boundary though. If you want me to pour out blessings that you cannot contain, if you want me to do that, then you're going to need to bring the tithe into my storehouse. God sets a boundary. Do you have to do that? No, you don't have to do that. But if you want God to pour out blessings that you can't contain, God writes a condition there. No, look, let's, keep, let's keep going. Um, um, look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, how many, you know, the, the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus instructed us to pray, and this is how he instructed us to pray. He said this. He said um, that we could pray, give us this day our daily bread. How many has ever prayed that prayer? So when they, told, when they asked Jesus, how do we pray? That was one of the things Jesus said. God's your provider. He's your father. And so we're, we're to pray that, that uh, we're to ask him to meet our needs. So to meet our needs. So, so here's, here's what I want you to see. God, God's a boundary setter. There's a lot of times we're praying for things, but we're not doing what we're supposed to do. 
Okay, gave us this day our daily bread was not permission to sit on your tail all day long and not do anything. Because God has a boundary. Here's God's boundary. We, while we are to pray for God to meet our needs, this is, listen, listen to what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. This is a boundary. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. God says, here's the boundaries in my family. If you don't work, no, no, you go to bed without dinner. Then you're like, oh, I can't believe. You. That's the boundary God set. Look, look, there is plenty of food in my house. God has no shortage. God has no shortage. Yet here's the boundary he sets in his family. If you don't work, you don't eat. Now, you don't have to do the same work that everybody else does, but you've got to do something. How many know what I'm talking about? When, okay, as your kids are growing up, do you give them responsibilities? Yes. They're not just going to be, they're not just going to eat a bag of chips all day, right? They're going to have to do something. They're going to have to take out the trash. They're going to have to do something. They're going to have to clean their room. They, something. They got to do something. They got to mow the yard or something. Why? Because you're teaching them, you're teaching them a godly principle that this is how it works. If, if, if you want God, listen, work Believe it or not, now some of you might be thinking, you don't know my boss. Work is not a curse. It's not a curse. I, there's a lot of people that believe because of the fall of man that God gave them work. That's not true. Before the fall of man, he gave them a job to do. This, is the, this, this garden belongs to you. Tend it. You got to take care of it. You're responsible to tend the garment. You're going to have uh, the garden. You're going to have to tend to it. You're going to have to work it. After the fall, the ground became cursed, so the work became a curse. It became hard. By the sweat of your brow, you're going to have to. God never intended it to be like that. God's, God's design was for there to be reward for your work. God created us that way. So that there is a reward after your work. Did you know that when you get to heaven, you will be, you will be rewarded according to your works? Now, we don't, get, we don't get saved according to our works, but there's rewards attached to it. God knew what he was doing. All the, look at all the parables that Jesus taught in Scripture about rewards for being faithful and work. And so, so it's, we need to understand that we, listen, it's okay if you're praying that prayer, but if you're praying that prayer and you're not doing nothing, you got to step back and go, okay, God, what is, God says, I, I want to bless, I want to bless, I want to bless whatever you set your hand to. Well, that's talking about work. So I always say this, that God's not going to bless it unless you put your hand to it. So here's the point about work. Work's not a curse. It is an open door for a natural law that God has established for there to be reward for us. There are certain things that God does for us that's not tied to work. But there are certain things God's like, come on, you got to do something. I, I, I heard about the guy who, who was praying that, they would, that he would win the lottery. He's just praying and praying and praying for months and months and months to win the lottery. And he got really upset with God. And he said, God, I don't understand. Why, why, why I prayed and I'm praying and I'm praying. You said if I would pray anything in Jesus' name, I could have it. And I'm praying in Jesus' name, I could win the lottery. And God spoke with a booming voice and he said, son, you got to buy the lottery ticket. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That does not, that does not, I'm not giving you permission to go buy a lottery ticket. That was a joke. Okay, that was a joke. You got to do, you have to do something. I was reading a scripture this, uh, a few weeks ago, and the Lord really hammered me on something. He's, the scripture says this, it talks about that he who tills his own land will be satisfied. In other words, you can have all the land in the world, but if you don't work it, you're going to get nothing. And so we can sit around and go, well, I, I don't understand why I'm not blessed. And God's saying, okay, well, what's in your hand? I, I gave you something, and I use it. Use it, and I'll bless it. Okay. Um, that was a long time on that point. Um, I, want you to see, I want you to see, God, God is a boundary setter. There's conditions. And so God wants to pour out blessings, but, but there's conditions. We got to do something. Now, salvation is available for everyone. Amen? Amen. God longs 
for every tribe, every tongue, every nation to be saved. In fact, look at what it says in Titus. In Titus chapter 2. Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, says this. You don't have to turn there. This is a really short scripture. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to some men. No, all men. The grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. All. All means all. All men. Well, brother, I don't know what that, I don't think that means all. But no, it's all. All. Well, the Hebrew for all is all. It's, it's all. I guess in this instance it would be the Greek word. All. Salvation is available to all. God belongs for every. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to salvation. That's what Scripture says. God, 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 God loved the world so much that He sent His Son to rescue all of humanity. It's this idea, there's this idea rolling around in the world. It's been around forever that this universalism idea that everyone, everyone's going to be good in the end. God has established a family dynamic and he set a boundary. He loves all humanity. Everyone's invited. You want to be a part of my family? I'm, I'm here to adopt you. But here's, here's, here's the rub. Here's, here's the boundary right here. Here's the, the boundary that I've set. You and in this family, here's the property lines right here. Jesus said in verse 6 of John 14, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Well, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Well, you don't have to agree with that. But to be a part of his family, you got to agree with that. You can be the part of another family, but if you're going to be a part of his family, that's, that's the boundary. That's the gate. That's what will get you in the door. Look, look, what it, look what Jesus, speaking of door, look what Jesus says in John 10. John 10, verse 9, Jesus says this, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. I am, Jesus is saying, I am the door. No one, comes, no one comes to the Father's house except they come through me. I mean, I'm the door. I'm the gate. And so if you want to receive if you want to receive salvation, you have to come through Jesus. There is salvation and no other name. You, you, you cannot pray to the east three times a day and think that'll get you there. You, you, cannot, you cannot do all the good in the world and think that will get you there. There's only one door. Well, I don't like that. Well, that's, then, you know, how many's ever had a, had a kid who doesn't like the rules you set for your, for your family. Do you bend to them or do you say, or do they go, well, but why? What do you normally say? Because I said so. So why, why is Jesus the only way? Because God said so. And God is the father. It's his house. It's his home. These are the conditions and the boundaries set that I've set. So God sets boundaries on how we are to relate to him. The Ten Commandments. Go to Exodus 20. We're going to read some of the Ten Commandments here. Exodus 20. These are, these are not, they're, they're not suggestions. They're the Ten Commandments. And so God has established these as a way to, re, to show us the boundaries for how we relate to him and how we relate to one another. And Jesus said it like this. Jesus said, if you, you got to love God, love your neighbor, right? And Jesus said, if you can learn how to do those, that, that, be, that all the law hinges on those two things. It's because those two things speak to the spirit of what this is written about, the Ten Commandments. It's how we relate to God the Father and how we relate to one another in God's family. <laughs> so so let's, look at, let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. God, God sets this boundary and he says this, I'll be your God, but this is how I roll. If I'm going to be your God, you can't have no other. Well, that seems 
kind of, it seems kind of possessive. How many are married in here? Raise your hand. And when you walk down the aisle, and at, at, as you're, you know, saying your vows, if your, if your spouse would have looked at you and said, I just want you to know, I love you. And you're, in, you're, you're well within my top 10. <laughs> how many of you would be like, it, was, mm. it is over. I don't care how much money we spend on this thing. It's over. We, we, we ain't going no further than right now. Because you're asking for exclusivity. You are saying... There will be no others. I'm not going to, God's saying, I will not share my throne with another. So if you want me to be your God, this is how it works. I am the only one. You will have no other before me. Okay. Well, this is the boundary. That's God's boundary. I'm not going to, I'm, all, I'm not going to share Godship with anybody. When I do weddings, I often say this um, in the vow part. Um, there's a line that says, forsaking all others, right? Forsaking all others. Do you, do you commit to love? Fill in the blank. And so God's saying this right here with the first of the Ten Commandments. This is the first thing he's saying. I'm asking you to forsake all others. I'm God. And if you got another one, we can't move forward. Well, that seems mean. I can't believe God would be. Listen, in the, in the context of relationship with God, that's the way it works. That's the boundary he sets. I'll, I'll, not, share, I'll not share your affection with someone else. Th- then he says this, you, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that um, is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea. You shall not bow down to them or serve, or, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so God said, not only, not only I, no other gods, you, you can't go carving a bunch of images, even of me. How many, how many has ever seen like ancient ruins or something? They always have like carved images. And so God's saying, you, you, you can't have something. You can't, can't, don't worship an image or an icon. I mean, no, there are religions that do that. And God's saying, that's not how, listen, I, I'm it. Not an image of me, me. You need to worship me. Not, not an image of me. I mean, know that there are times even in Christianity where we, we worship something other than him. We, we worship a tradition in the church. We get it mixed up. We're, we're not to, we're not, well, you know, I, I remember when I led worship um, for years, I remember one time I was, I was leading worship and I opened my eyes and we were kind of in revival setting and, and so this has been going on for days and days and days and I remember in the middle of this worship service, I opened my eyes. I often close my eyes because I didn't, I, I, I struggled sometimes um, with what I saw. And I, I needed, because I was leading in worship, so I needed worship. And so I, I, I am the, I'm, the, I'm the guy who gets distracted by things. And so I remember I opened up my eyes and I realized if I go to this specific song, this place will erupt. This place is going to go nuts. And I realized the power that I had. And that I could easily become a puppet master. And here's the point I want to make is, sometimes, like in worship, we'll idolize a song that made us feel a certain way. And we forget about the one we're worshiping, and it's about the song. Well, I, I don't like that song. They say, I, it, we, didn't, we didn't sing it for you. <laughs> Amen? We, we wasn't about you. We, we, there's only one we're trying to please in worship, and that's him. And so sometimes it's like, well, well, why don't you ever sing that? Well, okay, well, if God, if we feel like that's where God was, okay, we, listen, I, I, I appreciate the fact that Corey prays, that he prays and he gets before God. Here's, listen, we got to be very careful that we don't marry tradition in the church. We're married to him. Amen? And so listen, idolatry can show up in a lot of different ways. 
There have been sometimes, sometimes church is keeping things alive and God's trying to kill it. <laughs> well, we got to do this, Pastor, because we've always done it this way. Well, how, 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 how effective is it? Well, not at all. It's not effective at all. We're losing everything. Okay, well, maybe, maybe stop. Step back. Our, is, is God speaking something and you're not hearing him? Don't. That's about, okay, that was, a, that was free. Um, you shall, here's the next, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. These are boundaries that God sets in our relationship with him. If he's going to be God in our life, this is the boundaries he set for us. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I, I, I grew up with this concept of the, taking the name of the Lord in vain was like attaching it to a cuss word, like saying, I'm not going to say it, but uh, GD or something like that, uh, where, where we attach it. Have you ever think about that? You're, at, you're like declaring God to damn something? How stupid is that? Right? I mean, how utterly stupid is it for us to say those kind of things? And, and, and so we use, you know, Jesus or God just flippantly, like, you know, um, it, it, just, just, it just becomes an idle word. And, and, and so that's part of using his name in vain. It's emptying the power that's in that name. It's, it's like using, uh, using his name without any thought of really what that name means. But I, I was looking at the verbiage of this, and it says, it, it says, you shall not take, you shall not take, take, the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Don't not take. So, so when me and Lori got married, she took, she took my name. My, my children, they take my name. I, I've known people who have who have changed their last name because they wanted to distance themselves from a person or like a father figure who they wanted no part of, and, and, and so they would change their name because that was an embarrassment. That name didn't carry weight; it carried shame. Um, we shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. When we became a believer, we took his name. We become identified with Christ. There was a time when I was working for a gentleman, and, and he was a believer, and he didn't mind telling people. He owned a business, and he, he didn't mind telling people, letting people know he was a believer. And a lot of times when people would find out he was a believer, they would they would say, oh, I'm a Christian too. And we kind of had a joke in the office about this because generally that meant that that person was not, that person was a con man. Here's, here's, and my, my boss would often say, I'd rather do business with a heathen than a Christian who doesn't act like one. I mean, that's using the name of the Lord in vain. That is associating with God, but not acting like like you're his. You ever have a child who you're like, <laughs> I know you're not mine because my kid don't act like that. Right? Or you're like, you look at your, your spouse and go, your kid, right? <laughs> you need to get a you know, hold of your kid. It's, it's, because, it's because there is, when a kid misbehaves in public, the reflection's not on the kid, it's on the name that the kid carries. It's the same thing with God. If we associate with God, if we are saying, I'm his child, then God expects us to act like it. The thing that Jesus got so upset about with the Pharisees over and over and over and over was their hypocrisy. It was, you name, you, you say the name of, you say you're associated with me, but you don't even know me. You, he, he would say, remember he said, you're going to get a bunch of converts and you'll make, them, you'll make them more a son of, of the devil, your father, than you are. What he was saying was, you think you're associated with me, but I'm telling you right now, you are not acting like my son. You're acting like somebody else's son. That is using the name of the Lord in vain. It is not, carrying, it not understanding the weight of my identity to carry his name. There is power in his name. We, we talked about that earlier, right? There is power in the name of Jesus. We need to understand that. When we carry his name, we need to go out and make him proud of us. We, we need to act in such a way where we reflect to the world the goodness of who this God is that, we're, that is our Father. <clears throat> 
So God sets these boundaries and says, listen, if you're going to take my name, you need to be responsible with it. When a, when a child is, is getting older and you give them the keys to your car, that is your car. That's not their car. That's your car. Is they're learning to drive. What, you're, you're, you're expecting them to be responsible with your car because your name's on the car and your name is on the insurance. Yeah. That is your car. Yeah. And if they are irresponsible, it will affect you. Enough on that. God also, in the Ten Commandments, lays out some scripture on how we're to, how do we relate to one another, how we're to set boundaries and how we relate to one another. Verse 12, honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is in your neighbor's. I will say this, the non-animal person that I am, I think I'm good on the ox, donkey, and, and, um, and cats and dogs thing. But um, and God's saying, here's the boundaries. <laughs> and God had to set this up because, you know, the, the second generation, the sin of the second generation was a brother killed a brother. And boundary violation. <laughs> That's not how you act. It's not how you respond and, and relate to one another. So God says, here, here's the boundaries and how you relate to one another. In my house, this is how my family acts. In my house, there's going to be a culture of honor. You're going to honor your parents. I think it's interesting that honor comes with the reward. You want a reward? Honor your parents. That's what God's saying. In my house, we're going to have a culture of honor. If you can't honor, that if you can't honor in his house, God, listen, God's saying, that you can't, you, I can't, God's saying, I can't honor you. I can't, I can't bless you in the way I want to bless you if you can't honor one another. I, I think it's interesting. It doesn't say honor your parents as long as they're good and perfect and wonderful and you love them and you like everything they do. It was this honor, your father, there is no condition to that. You honor them. Well, you don't know what my father and my mother are like. It's irrelevant. You don't know what they've done to me. I, honor's a choice. It's always a choice. Well, they haven't earned honor. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say they're to earn honor. God says, this is how you relate. This is how the family dynamic works. You honor you honor your father and mother. In the house of God, you honor those who are in authority. That, that, that's all throughout Scripture. And he says, <laughs> I love the what he puts here at the, at the beginning here. He says, you don't murder. Yeah, just so you know, that's a boundary. Don't cross. There are times when you feel like taking someone out of this world and you don't think the world will really miss them because they're horrible people. And God's saying, don't, don't murder. There's, there are biblical ways to deal with someone Right when there's when there's conflict, and, and the way is not you know decking them, although that's not murdering them. Um, but <laughs> there are, we don't right we don't. The, Jesus said this: if you hate them, if you hate them, right? If there's hate in your heart, it's the same thing. So not only do we not physically carry it out, we need to make sure we don't harbor murder in our heart either, and that we deal with that. That we that we are are are. Um, we're on top of that. that. That's a boundary in our relationship with people. I don't think any of us would disagree that that's a re- very good boundary. Right? How many are glad somebody hadn't taken you out because they got mad at you? Has anybody got mad at you? You know what? I've, I'm, you know, I, I get angry when someone does something crazy on the road and they're not thinking and, and I got my family in the car and, 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 and they you know, almost, almost caused me to wreck. Well, guess what? I've done that too. And I'm, I'm glad that even as they go by and they're screaming and hollering, I usually don't look at them. Um, that, that they're not like trying to run me off the road and kill me. You shall not commit adultery. Adultery is stepping over the boundary line that God has established for marriage relationships. And going back to this forsaking all others. In this relationship with God, there's this There's this concept of forsaking all others. And God's saying in the marriage relationship, it's the same thing. You're forsaking all others. It's a violation of faithfulness. God is a faithful God, and he expects us in our relationship with one another to be faithful. It's the boundaries God sets for us. You shall not steal. Stealing, man, thieves 
just, oh, it just oh, gets under my skin because I'll, I'll do good for anybody I can, I, anybody I can help. I, I, I will try to do good. I, I will try to help them out. But to take from me, just to steal from me, anybody struggle with that? That's a boundary violation. Don't come on my property and take something of mine. If you have need, humble yourself and come ask me. Don't you come take something from me without asking. That's, that's a violation of how we relate to one another. Um, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. I was thinking about lying. Lying always comes with an agenda. You ever think? Ly, lying always is to save your tail, right? It, it, or, or, or it's to get the focus off of you. It's, it's to cover up something. It's to gain an advantage, maybe. Um, lying is a, a, to manipulate and control a situation. Lying can be to be, persuade someone else. Um, lying can be about pe- appeasing or pleasing someone else. Lying can be about getting revenge. Whatever the agenda, when you lie against someone else, it's a boundary violation in your relationship with them. When you lie against someone, you, le- you illegally benefit yourself at the expense of them. That's against everything. That's against everything. Every principle in God's, in God's family is to think only about yourself. That's against everything that God stands for. How many, I'm not gonna, I was going to say, how many are, have been good liars in the past, but don't, don't, don't answer that question. You, do not covet your neighbor's things. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a result of n- not being satisfied with what God's blessed you with, what you've been given. And so we covet. Maybe you're not going to steal it, but you, you don't not, you're not going to like them because they got it. Right? Uh, or you'll, or you'll, you'll get into com- competition mode. You've got to have what they have. Anybody ever been there? Got to keep up with the Joneses? You, so they get a new car, so you go into debt. How to them? They get a bigger house. You go into debt like crazy, uh, and spend. Listen, it's it's crazy. That's crazy. But that's all about. That's all tied to coveting. It's all tied about into being jealous or envious of what somebody else has. That's that's a boundary violation. That's not how we do. we're to we're to rejoice with those who rejoice. Those who have been blessed. We're to we we don't like. I can't believe they went and got the new iPhone. Yeah. It's great that you did that. Or they got a, you know, 82-inch television. I don't even know if they make 82 inches. But, <laughs> but and, and so, you know, you go mortgage the farm to get a bigger one. It, it's just crazy. You don't need it. Um, let's go to a couple of New Testament verses about how these boundaries look in our relationship with one another. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Let, wow. So God's saying in your relationship with one another, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. conceit. Let's just repent and, and, and just go home because that's, that's all we need right there. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. That's a powerful powerful scripture and setting boundaries on how we're to relate to one another. This world is a selfie world. It belongs, it does not belong in the church. It doesn't belong in the church. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also the interest of others. He's telling us that this is how I expect you in my family, to relate to one another. Look at Galatians chapter 6. Just got a couple more verses. I'm going to wrap this up. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spiritual a spirit of what? Gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. I want to look at this 
bearing burdens thing real quick and s- says that we're to bear one another's burdens. How many's ever gotten in a situation or circumstance where you needed help? You know, um, you needed somebody to intervene. You needed an intervention to help you out. There are times in our lives where we get overwhelmed by things and we need help. We need help from other members in the family of God. We, we need somebody to reach out and help us. Let me just say this. We don't need to stay there. There, there are times when, yeah, we need someone to carry the heavy burdens in our lives, like boulders. We need someone to carry the boulders because we can't carry them. We need, we need a family to help us do that. But notice that it also says you're to carry your own load. In the body of Christ, there's no place for free, freeloaders. That, we established that earlier. There, there's, there's no place for that. And some of you get really, really, really angry about our society and the fact that you're taxed to, to, to help other people. Listen, there are times when people, listen, there have been a time, I, I'm just going to say this, there's been a time in my life when I was on food stamps. It was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I hated that season. There came a time in our, our life where we, we, we needed help. We, we just needed help. And it's been many, many years ago. And let me just say, there's no incentive to get off, none. We had to make a decision, we're done. We had it for a few months and we were done. There are times in our lives when we need someone to help us carry the load. But at some point, at some point, once the boulder's been moved, we're to carry our own load now. That's, that's the way, that's the boundaries in the family of God. There are times when you need help. There are times when you're to help others. But everyone's to carry their own load. Everyone's to roll up their sleeves and get after it. Everyone in the body of Christ. Um, there's a word in this passage, the word trespass. Anybody know what happens if somebody crosses your property line uninvited? That is called trespassing. So, trespassing is a boundary violation. That's what it is. I, I often, if I'm sitting at the sink, maybe making coffee in the morning or something, we have a lot of people that walk. Um, and a lot of them have dogs, and they walk by, and you can see them out the front door. And, and it just seems like every single one, for some reason, stops at my house and has their dog on the leash and lets their dog go poo in my yard. A man who does not particularly like pets. One of the reasons why I don't like pets is because of stepping in dogness. I don't like that. And I watch these people and I think, clean up after your dog. Because you're not going to step in it. I'm the one that's going to step in it. Now, it's a, it's a funny story about trespassing, but here's, here's the point. In Scripture, if there's a boundary violation... In Scripture, we are always to deal with it. Now, the right way to deal with that is not going out there with my shotgun and screaming and hollering at them and get that dog off my property. That's not, that's, not the bit, that's not the way we deal with it. But sometimes there's a conversation that needs to be had, and that's not... Listen, it would not be ugly. And some of you are like, I would never do this. Well, I, 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 I guess I would never do it either because I haven't done it. But instead of being frustrated, and there's a lot of times when boundaries in our lives have been crossed, and we just get frustrated and we never have a conversation. Or we have a conversation that is emotionally off the charts. Neither of those are appropriate. To have a conversation, though, sometimes is difficult. And, and to go out there and say, look, I know this is probably no big deal to you, but that's your dog. And I don't mind if you, dog, if you let your dog poo in my yard but I would like for you to take it with you when you go. And some of you, I'll give, let me, you, you're never going to forget this analogy, okay? The, the, the pastor talked about dog poo. There are times in our lives when we don't address trespasses. We just move on. We sweep it under the rug, and it's still there. In God's family, God always says that we are to deal with trespasses. We pray the prayer God, forgive me my trespasses, right? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That, what we're saying is, those who have violated the boundaries of my life, I need to forgive them. I need to deal with it. 
Sometimes that means a conversation. Sometimes that is, God, I forgive them. So, some, but it, if we trespass against God, we're to deal with the trespass. That God's like, here's how, we deal with, here's how we deal with elephants in the room. We talk about them. What a concept. What, right? what a concept. July 4th is coming up. Some of you will, will spend time with, with family. And, and when family gets together, there's generally some elephant in the room, right? And no one ever talks about it. And 25 years later, the elephant's still in the room. Well, sometimes you've got to have the conversation. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. Okay. Enough about trespassing dogs. One last scripture. Go to, back to Exodus chapter 20 as we close. So God gives us boundaries on how do we relate to him and also how we relate to one another. Sometimes we're in abusive relationships and we need space. We need, that, 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 that's true. We're always to deal with offenses, though. Trespasses. We're, we're always to deal with those. Never sweep them under the rug or ignore them. Um, here's one of the reasons why you do that, by the way, is someone who's hurtful to you, if they're not called on it, they will continue to hurt others. Sometimes they have no clue that they're doing it. And you've just got to say, look, I just want to let you know, um, that offended me that you did that. It was a, you trespassed. You went across a boundary. Well, I never, I never realized that. And when we have that conversation in the body of Christ, in the family, a lot of times that fixes things. I don't know, but you, I, I like things to be fixed. And, and so in the body of Christ, we need to learn how to do that in the biblical, the biblical way. The last thing I, uh, I, I wanted to say today is, uh, if you're really on your toes, I know some of you knew this, but you know I skipped, you, I skipped the commandment. I only, only did the nine commandments today. So um, there's one I left out. And this is, this is the one I left out right here. It's the one our culture always leaves out, by the way, even in the church. The church is really good at leaving this one out. Here it is. Verse 8, Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Hmm. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Holy, S- set it apart. No, it's a different day. It's different. And our society is things a lot. We don't want to be... We need to be very careful. We don't, want to, we don't want to approach this with legalism. There's some people who are like, well, it has to be Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath. It has to be Sabbath the seventh day. This is what Scripture says. It says that, that the Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath was not made for God. It was made for man. That's what Jesus said. Let's, let's look what happens in uh, Exodus 31. God created the world, and on the seventh day, he rested. Look what it says in Genesis, or Exodus 31, verse 7. And he says this. He says, it is a sign between... He's talking about the Sabbath. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Isn't that interesting? God, God rested, and God was refreshed. God rested... And then was refreshed. How many, how many go through your life borderline burnout all the time? And God said, uh, God designed us, and, and this is what he said. This is, what, this is how you do it. You've got to have a Sabbath. The, per- the reason of a Sabbath is so that you can be refreshed. There was a time in my life when I had three jobs. Three. Insanity. And, and leisure, I didn't need more money at that time in my life. I was single. I mean, I could live on like, you know, peanut butter and crackers. I mean, I didn't need a whole lot of money. But I had three jobs. It was insanity. I never had a day off. I worked overnights. I would work overnights. And then I would get up. I, I would not even, I'd, I'd go from one job overnight to another job, work all day. And, um, and work a couple of days. And so I would go, I'd go a couple of days without sleep and then I would crash for a day. And I would just be, total, listen, that ain't healthy. And so God's saying, look, here's the model. This is the way you were designed. You were designed to work and take a day off. 
the reason why you take a day off is not so you can be so busy that you have to go back to work to rest, <laughs> right? Because anybody ever go to a, on a vacation, you got to come home to go on a vacation? You're like, I need a vacation from my vacation. We get, we get it wrong. God's saying, look, you need a Sabbath so you can be refreshed. It's a boundary. And you gotta, you got to set that boundary in your life. So we talked about and how we relate to God, how we relate to one another. But also, there, you have to learn how to... Everybody say this. I'm going to give you... I'm going to give... This is the word for the week. This is going to help you. This is going to help you with this boundary, okay? This boundary about being refreshed. Everybody say it's a, it's a two-letter word. No. Everybody say that with me. No. Now, some of you didn't say it because it's hard for you to say. Say it with me again. No. Well, that... But, but they need my help. Well, Okay. No, yeah, no, so, listen, listen, it's okay, it's okay to set that boundary, it's okay. And God says, listen, if you don't do this, does anybody know why the children of Israel, the major reason why the children of Israel um, were taken into bondage for, was it 70 years? They violated what? The Sabbath. They violated the Sabbath. That's how serious God is on this. Look, I, I say this all, all the time, that if you don't take care of yourself, I think it's interesting that scripture we read a minute ago, it said, not only be concerned about you, the, your affairs, but others as well. In other words, don't, you don't neglect yourself, right? In a plane, what do they tell you? If, 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 if the oxygen masks fall, what do they tell you? Put yours on first, so you can help others. And some of us are running through life and, and God's saying, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. And then we get put in a hospital and God's like, okay, well, you gonna rest one way or another? <laughs> you gotta rest. So we're gonna close with this, but I, so next month we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna have a series and it's just gonna be, it's gonna be called Refreshing. And we're gonna help you Create a culture in your, in, your, in your life that is refreshing. We're, we're going we're gonna to just teach biblical principles about, listen, how many know that God's word is like, God's word is like being in the middle of a desert, desperately needing a drink, and it's like water. So in the middle of July, in the middle of July, the hottest time of the year, we're going to do a series on refreshing. And um, so if you need to be refreshed, you need to come, come, enjoy, enjoy the glass of cold water, amen? Corey, you can go ahead and come as, as you just bow your heads and close your eyes this morning. Just ask the Holy Spirit, what is it that he wants to speak to you right now? His, his sheep hear his voice. So just ask him, what is it you want me to get today? What is it you're speaking to me specifically? If there are some boundaries that, that you violated, you just deal with it. Because that's what we do in the family of God. You just deal with it. So if you've trespassed against God, you've violated a boundary, just ask him right now, just God, I ask you to forgive me. I, I crossed the line. It's interesting. He says his sheep know his voice. There's this conviction not condemnation, but conviction, because God, God wants us to be like him. And he'll never let a violation, a trespass, go without bringing it to our attention. You, you, you cross the, the boundary line there, and I just, can we have a conversation about that? And so God's saying, I, I want you to do the same with others. So maybe there's some that have crossed the boundary and trespassed against you. Just forgive them. Just right now, just forgive them. And if God instructs you that you need to have a conversation, just have the difficult conversation. Just have it. (laughs) 
You may be here today that you're not a member. I'm not talking about a member of a church. You're not a member of the family of God. Maybe you're uh, watching online. Maybe you go to church. and Maybe you don't. But you've never officially accepted God's invitation to be a part of his family. To accept him as your heavenly father. As I mentioned earlier, salvation is for everybody. Jesus said this, anybody that comes to him, I will no wise cast you out. It doesn't matter what you've done, where you've been. None of, none of that matters. If you want to receive his invitation to be his child, today's your day. So what God has done is he's invited you, sent out the invitation, and then he's prepared the way. No one comes to the Father except for Jesus. He says, I, I made a way for you to get into my family. It's through Jesus. And so this is what you have to do. You have to believe that God sent his son Jesus to die for your sin. Then you have to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's a non-negotiable. Then you have to confess Jesus is Lord. We talked about God saying, you shall have no other gods before me. It's salvation. It's where you acknowledge that he is, he is who he says he is. And you receive him as the one and only in your life. So if that's you and you're in this place, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. Just say, that, that's me. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not where I should be. That my, my dad went to church my entire life and wasn't saved until later on in my life. He went every Sunday. So if that's you, and maybe you're like, well, yeah, but I, I go to church. It's not about going to church. It's about coming to the altar like we talked about with a husband and wife and where we say, God, you are the only one I forsake all others today, you are, you're, you're my only God. Anybody? Just for those that might be watching online, that might, they might watch this today, they might watch it next month, they might watch it three years from now, I, I don't know. I would hate for someone to watch this someday that doesn't know Jesus and not have an opportunity to receive him. So for those that might be watching, I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer after me. Say, dear God, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin. I repent of my sin. I ask you right now to cleanse me of all sin. I believe that three days later, after Christ died for me, he was raised from the dead. Today, I make him Lord of my life. There is not another one. I make Jesus the one and only Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. Hmm. I know it's hot today. It's hot today. So you're going to leave here and it's going to be really hot, really, really, really hot. Do what? Since we're going to teach on refreshing, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help you out. Okay? So every Sunday when you leave, I'm going to give you something refreshing. We're giving you the word that's refreshing. But then when you walk out the door, I'm going to put, we're going to put something in your hand that you're going to be like, whew, this is good stuff. So that when you leave here, you're going to be refreshed. Because I know it's July and it's hot. And so we're going to even help with that. Okay? So, so for no other reason, you need to come to see what that's about. Right? Okay, I hope you come for something other than that. Right? Let's bow our heads and dismiss. Father, we thank you for your word today. God, we love you. We appreciate the fact that you are so good to us. Sometimes we, we struggle with what your good looks like. Because sometimes we don't get what we want when we want it. 
But God, we know that you are always good to us. And so, Father, we just pray that you would just, um, we, we just pray that we would always be thankful and we would always remember about your goodness. Family, what are your thoughts when you hear this word? Dinners, birthday parties, graduations, and weddings? Do you think of love, intimacy, and laughter? Or do you think of pain, absence, and conflict? Whatever your thoughts are, family was God's idea. His desire is for you to join his vibrant and growing family. A family marked by sacrifice and acceptance, marked by diversity and unity, marked by an eternal significance. A family like that would be no ordinary family.